also called the Great Northern Diver because of its ability to dive and swim long distances underwater. It does this to catch the small fish which are its main food or simply to evade its enemies. Balloon's legs are so far back on its body that movement on land is slow and awkward. So the nests are very close to water. The calls of Balloon, and it has several calls in its repertoire, have come to symbolize Canada's wilderness because of their lonely, haunting quality. For a more complete story of the loon, why not contact the Canadian Wildlife Service in Ottawa? <laughs> <laughs> you've, uh, you've just watched and listened to a public service announcement that played often on Canadian public television when I was a child. The Canadian Wildlife Service produced these PSAs in the 1960s and 70s to educate Canadians about wildlife in Canada. It was a little hard for me to decide which one minute vignette I wanted to show you this morning. I could have chosen the beaver, raccoon, snowy owl, moose, muskox, chipmunk, but I finally settled on the loon whose haunting calls from across a glassy northern lake at dusk is ingrained in my childhood memory. I am sure that many Canadians of my vintage or older would immediately recognize the musical refrain that started each of these PSAs. Though a hinterland specifically refers to an area behind a coast or a or the shoreline of a river, this series covered animals from multi, a multitude of ecosystems, borrowing from the spirit of hinterland who's who. I thought that this morning I would share a few vignettes about my home country of Canada. Though as I, I pondered the idea of doing that in a sermon, and thinking about a nation as large and diverse as Canada, it was kind of hard to think of what I would focus on. Realize it wasn't going to be easy to capture the large geographically and culturally diverse nation in one sermon. So I figured I'd just share a few vignettes. And for those of you who don't know yet, I am Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Saying the phrase out loud, though, it sort of, sort of reminds me of the national pride that seems to be hidden in Canada for the most part, except in the very patriotic business of selling beer and coffee. You see, we Canadians thought that patriotism was reserved for the ostentatious flag-waving and wearing of our neighbors to the south, and the chants of USA, USA that can be heard at many uh, international sporting events or other activities. Yet in hindsight, I know that Canadians were and are not immune from displays of patriotism, found in the form of wearing the latest version of the uniform the Canadian team wore at the most recent Winter Olympics, and as I said, selling beer and coffee. You see, some years ago, the Canadian Brewing Company, which no longer is Canadian because it's owned by Coors Brewing Company in the U.S., <laughs> they advertised its premier brand called Molson Canadian with this rousing advertisement that trumpeted the national, national pride and nationalism. The commercial attempted to dispel some myths that some people might have about Canadians and Canada. It went a little like this. Hey! I'm not a lumberjack, or a fur trader. I don't live in an igloo, or eat blubber, or own a dog sled. And I don't know Jimmy Jolly or Susie from Canada, although I'm sure they're really, really nice. I have a prime minister, not a president. I speak English and French, not American, and I pronounce it about, not a boot. I can proudly sew my country's flag on my backpack. I believe in peacekeeping, not policing, diversity, not assimilation, and that the beaver is truly proud and noble animal. A toque is a hat, and a Chesterfield is a couch. It is pronounced Z, not Z, Zed. 
Canada is the second largest land mass, the first nation in hockey, and the best part of North America. <laughs> My name is Joe, and I am Canadian. I don't know if you've heard also of the famous purveyors of donuts. I understand they sell their donuts in the U.S. as well. Tim Hortons. Uh, they've also used uh, this idea of being a proud Canadian to sell their wares. I recall an advertisement from, for a, from a number of years ago where there was this Canadian student who was living in Glasgow, Scotland and going to the University of Glasgow. He tells this story in the commercial about how he and his roommate decorated their entire dorm room to be Canadian. Hockey sticks, goalie masks, snow globes, um, and they called it Caribou House. Well, at the end of the commercial, he, he laments how it just isn't Canadian enough until he wrote to Tim Hortons and they sent him a box of coffee. And at the end of the commercial, he says, you know, there are some things that just say home over a cup of Tim Hortons coffee in Glasgow. <laughs> It was, I read in a recent uh, newspaper article, uh, a quote from somebody who was drinking uh, a Tim Hortons coffee in one of their shops. He said, what pops into my mind when I think of Tim Hortons is Canada. It's distinctly Canadian. It ties into the culture. It's somewhere everybody goes. Oh, just a little tidbit. So, if you ever go to a Tim Hortons and you order a double-double, don't expect to get what you get in California when you order a double-double, which is a two, two hamburger patty with cheese. Two cheese, two hamburger, right? Double-double, two cheese, two hamburgers. Well, you see, if you go to uh, a Tim Hortons can and you say a double-double, you're not going to get a hamburger. You're going to get a cup of coffee that has two sugar and two cream. <laughs> And the whole idea of a double-double became so uh, infamous in Canada, it entered into the uh, 2004 Canadian Oxford Dictionary, an official entry, a double-double. I, I suppose we have this similarity uh, in nations that we use nationalism to sell us things. My first vignette is about... Did I say about or a boot? About... <laughs> about uh, a, a little piece of Canadian Unitarian history. Canadian Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Joan Montagnas, in, the, in her book titled Northern Lights, about UU congregations in Canada's West, wrote that we gather perhaps as northern lights rather than beacon lights as mere specks against the vast wilderness. If you have ever had the opportunity to experience the dancing of the aurora borealis, you may remember the subtleness of the color and the movement of lights across the northern horizon. This is an appropriate metaphor for Unitarian Universalism in Western Canada, and all of Canada. In all of Canada, with only 52 churches, congregations, and fellowships to serve a landmass of just under 10 million square kilometers, you can see that Unitarian Universalists in Canada are just mere specks of light against a vast space. This isn't to conclude that mere specks of light do not have great value. I just think of the mere specks of light in the sky each night that form constellations that have provided meaningful stories to people throughout the world for ages. A few of those specks of light on the Canadian prairie were formed in the Canadian province of Manitoba. The earliest Unitarian movement to root itself in Western Canada came from an unexpected source. In the late half of the 19th century, there was a mass migration from Iceland to North America. More than one-fifth of the island's population emigrated. Some settled in the states of Minnesota and North Dakota, but most came to Manitoba and later Saskatchewan. These emigrants brought with them their understanding of Lutheranism as it evolved in Iceland. And unlike the other, and other Lutheran settlers that they met from Germany and Norway, whose theology they thought of as intransigently orthodox, the Icelanders in comparison found themselves to be significantly more liberal. Reverend Philip Hewitt, who I just learned died this past week, 
in his book titled Unitarians in Canada, explains that the Icelanders have been saturated in, had been saturated in Old Norse mythology and had come to understand that Christianity was not an exclusive vehicle for religious insight. Icelandic poets had already voiced the hope for universal salvation in the 19th century. Disappointed with the direction of their Lutheran siblings, which was... Um, which, was, uh, which had been established uh, earlier in Manitoba, they found a leader, the Icelanders, found a leader in Bjorn Peterson, a farmer with some theological training in his childhood, who had also served for a number of years in the Icelandic parliament. He responded to an ad from the post office mission maintained by Unitarians in Minnesota, and he not only received literature about Unitarianism, confirming his theology was indeed Unitarian, but he also, through that correspondent, met a woman that in time would become his wife. Jenny McCain was the secretary at the mission in Minnesota and helped Peterson to attain funds from the American Unitarian Association to publish pamphlets in the Icelandic language. Two years later, Bjorn and Jenny started holding services in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And though, although Bjorn was the official minister, Jenny was often found in the pulpit. The first Icelandic Unitarian Church of Winnipeg was founded in 1891 by Icelandic Lutherans that lived north of Winnipeg on the shores of Lake Winnipeg and was served by Reverend Magnus Skaptason. On Easter Sunday in 1890, Skaptason's sermon was distinctly universalist in theology. Some sources say he left the Lutheran Synod two days later. Others say he was expelled. <laughs> this led to the withdrawal of five congregations from that Lutheran Synod, and they would eventually form an association of liberal churches, which is now part of what became the Canadian Unitarian Council. My next little vignette also has its roots in the area around Winnipeg, Manitoba. The song that we heard this morning, One Voice, uh, is written and recorded by a group called the Whalen Jennies, uh, who also hail from Winnipeg, Manitoba. It was in this area of, of what we now know as Winnipeg, Manitoba, in 1844, it was called the Red River Settlement. It was a settlement in an area of British North America known as Rupert's Land. It was called Rupert's Land because the British government had given a charter to the Hudson's Bay Company that they could control all of Western and Northern Canada for their own right to, uh, to engage in the, in the fur trade. The Red River Settlement was populated mostly by the Métis people. The Métis, is a, uh, the Métis people have a distinct culture that evolved from the off and they evolved from the offspring of First Nations people including Cree, Ojibwe, and Soto, and European fur traders that were mostly French and some Scottish and English. It was this, at this time in this Red River settlement that a man named Louis Riel was born. Louis Riel in the future would become known as a parent of Canadian Federation. His Métis family was already well known in the settlement for his father's activism in helping to free a Métis man who had been imprisoned for challenging the monopoly on trading furs and other goods that was held by the Hudson's Bay Company. Louis Riel would get to know the local Catholic priests who would discover the great promise that he had and help him to go to Montreal to study for seminary. Unfortunately, during that time, Riel's father died back in Red River, and so he moved home. He had experienced racism in Montreal, meeting a woman and uh, discovering that her family would not allow them to be married because they didn't want her involved with a Métis man. Riel is believed to, in the meantime, have worked in Chicago and St. Paul, Minnesota, prior then to returning to the Red River. It was upon his return to the Red River that the Canadian government was 
expanding to the west, taking over that charter from the Hudson's Bay Company and extending confederation into the west. The Métis had settled the Red River using the French system of seigneurie, which meant that each family had a, a strip of land that connected to a body of water for irrigation. But the Canadian government was going to use the uh, survey system of dividing land into mile squares and into 168 acre quarters that didn't, give it, didn't pay any attention to the way that the people who were already farming the land were living. The Métis were very concerned that they would lose their land as they did not have any official title and the Canadian government was going to provide title to the land to many Anglophones who were coming from Ontario to settle in the West. Louriel was invited to lead a resistance to the Canadian government and unfortunately the Métis people in the Red River settlement lost the title to their land. Many then moved further west to Saskatchewan and settled in an area known as Batoche. In the meantime, Louis Riel had had to flee to the United States to seek shelter from the Canadian government who treated him as being treasonous for leading this resistance to their desires to change the way that the land was being utilized and surveyed. He would return to Batoche later when the community called upon him again as the Canadian government moved further west and was going to survey again the land around Batoche. Louis Riel would return to lead a resistance that included a armed resistance to a large Canadian uh, military presence that would be eventually lost. Louis Riel was tried by the Canadian government, convicted of treason, and hung in Regina, Saskatchewan. The Métis people lost that battle in Batoche and would later self-identify as the road allowance people. After losing their land, many families, Métis families, would have to live on road allowances. Road allowances were those small strips of land between the 160-acre quarters that, uh, that um, were allowed for public roads to go through. The Métis in Canada continue to preserve their cultural heritage and come together every summer in Saskatchewan for Back to Batoche Days to celebrate who they are as a people. The two vignettes that I have shared included roles for the United States and its people. The American Unitarian Association was instrumental in establishing the tiny specks of light in the north known as the Icelandic Unitarian Churches. Louis Riel not only found work experience in the United States, he also found refuge when he learned that his life was threatened by the Canadian military. It has not only been Canadians finding help from Americans, but the same is true of Americans finding help from Canadians. I think of the many people who avoided being drafted to fight in Vietnam by moving to Canada. Recently, the U.S. administration has begun revoking what's called temporary protected status from refugees who have been allowed to live in the United States after suffering natural or human-made disasters through war and strife in their own countries. Since the revocation of temporary protective status for certain uh, refugees in the United States, no less than 20,593 asylum claims have been made in 2017 from people leaving the United States, many walking across the Canadian border to claim asylum status. That's 20, over 20,000 people just last year. So although we don't share the same history or political cultural patterns, I find that maybe, maybe because I, I know Unitarian Universalists best, we do, sh we do share common interests as people from both nations and struggle together to promote peace and justice. 
As the Unitarian Universalist Association of which this congregation belongs focuses on our moral and prophetic call to dismantle structural and systemic racism, Canadian Unitarians are deeply engaged in joining the national process for truth, reconciliation, and healing. In a letter to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, established by the Government of Canada to begin healing the injustice and hurt caused by Indian residential schools in Canada, Canadian Unitarians promised to continue to encourage our congregations and their members to learn more about the richness of Aboriginal spirituality and cultures, working together to advance the struggle for justice for Aboriginal people. We are all part of each other's interdependent web and carry responsibility for truth, reconciliation, and healing. Many people have asked me over the past years about my choice to remain and locate my ministry in the United States. Though I have joked with my colleagues about remaining in the United States due to the enormous amount of missionary work that needs to be done. <laughs> Just, just joking. I stay because of the affinity that I feel for the congregations I have been blessed to serve, including you, and a deep sense that together we can grow our ministries, bringing the saving message of Unitarian Universalism to ever more people. I have so much hope for the changes that are possible in our faithful quest for greater justice and a more peaceful existence. I know that we can do only do this by engaging with each other to create beloved community, doing the hard work to understand ourselves, our histories and stories, and others' selves, histories, and stories, our present in order to prepare and live into a future that is free from our current afflictions of inequality and multiple oppressions. And yet, like you, I can't help but despair doubting our capacity and our nation's capacities to make the changes that are necessary. With each passing day and news of hateful government policies that serve to divide rather than unite, gun violence, police brutality, and far too many illustrations of the continued systemic racism and oppression in our communities. And yet despite all of this, I still struggle to remain hopeful because for me, I, I have no other choice. I know that it is possible for our religious values and principles and those of our allies to lead us together to struggle, work and play for a better tomorrow. Though at times we may feel like mere specks against the vast wilderness of injustices and pain, it is when we join together with the spirit of life and of love the light of our community shines as a beacon of hope. As Reverend Mark Morrison Reed reminds us, there is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Let us strive to feel such connectedness, which once felt inspires us to act for love and for justice. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.